The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because the little one is a disciple, amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. So in the first reading, we have a story about the prophet Elijah uh, getting set up with hospitality with a wealthy woman and her family. But she has no, I should say her husband, because she hasn't got any children. And so, um, and so Elijah asks what he can do for the family. And, you know, he says, you know, talk to God, says the servant, because she might be wealthy, but she has no children. And she desperately wanted the blessing of a child. And so that happens. Prophet and so there is, uh, just as this widow has opened her house to, this, to the prophet, that he might share their life, so he shares their life in a whole new way by giving them a gift of life. And this is the meaning of hospitality. You know, to, be, to receive hospitality is to, uh, to be a guest and a guest has special privileges, especially in traditional societies. Uh, even in Christian societies, we have uh, traditions about treating guests as Christ. So uh, there was a 20th century author, Catherine de Hewitt Doherty. She was a Russian baroness. She married a, a uh, I forget if he was Canadian-American, name is Doherty anyhow, but they opened a, a uh, retreat house up in Canada. And she's famous for bringing a lot of Eastern and Russian style spirituality into the into the style of church icons, you know, the used to of uh, fasting days on bread and water and the Pustinia style of the Russians. But she tells one story about her her dad, and they were they were wealthy Russian noblemen in Saint Petersburg before the revolution, and but they were devout Christians, the Orthodox Christians, and and her father would maintain a room. So that if any beggar did come to the steps of the house and ask for something, you know, that, that man could be brought into the house, given this room. He would be given a bed to sleep in. He could stay one night. One night was the rule, because you can see how this kind of thing could be easily abused. Um, but he was treated as Christ. He was fed. He was housed. He was given the opportunity to get washed up and so forth. You know, and he, they really, the family really treated this beggar as Christ for the evening. And of course, he had to go out on his own business. And then the room was opened up again to receive whoever should come to the door as if they were Christ himself. And this is what hospitality is about. In the Middle East, it's a very serious thing, a very serious thing. There's a Persian story about a governor of a province who woke up one day by his guards and they said, we have very strange news for you. Your treasure room has been broken into. But as far as we can tell, nothing's been taken. So the governor sent out an edict, you know, my treasure is broken into, nobody thinks taken. There will be no consequences, but there's a story here and I want to hear it. And a man named Yaqub came forward and he identified himself as a master thief. And he says, you know, it took me a week to dig into your treasury, you know, without being noticed. 
and I specialize in working in the dark. I don't light a candle, I don't light a torch, lest the light or the smell of the torch be able to be detected by your guards. I work by touch, and he says, most importantly, taste. You know, I, if I'm not sure what a thing is, I lift it to my, I can tell the difference between silver and gold and brass. I can tell the textures of fabrics. I can tell you, um, I can tell you even gemstones, I can make a distinction with, because I'm that good. He said, I came into your, into your place and I was filling a sack full of all kinds of coins and jewels and, and other useful things, and I stubbed my bare toe on something hard and sharp on the floor. I thought it might be a jewel. I lifted it up, and it was, to my horror, a piece of rock salt, because salt was valuable, and salt, big stores of salt were kept in treasure rooms. And he says, and I realized, since I had partaken of your food, I could no longer rob you. And he dropped the bag and left. And uh, the story finishes, of course, by uh, he got hired by the governor to guard his treasury because the governor reasoned he can't steal from me since he, uh, he's received my hospitality and won't break it. And he says, who better to guard my treasury against thieves than a master thief? He eventually became governor of the province himself, by the way. It's a historical story. Um, but this is the kind of seriousness that hospitality has taken. If you take somebody under your wing, you are responsible for their lives. Your life and their life is connected. If you remember the story in, um, in, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, in Genesis, where the crowd comes after the angel to abuse him, and the angel is in the hot house of Lot. House, Lot's ready to send out his daughters. To our minds, this is absolutely horrid that you would sacrifice your daughters to a mob to protect your guest. But that's how seriously this stuff is seen. You take somebody on your protection, you better give them your protection. You take them under your roof, they share your food, they are yours. You're responsible for them. And sometimes, in the case of Elijah, the guest finds, oh, I guess I'm responsible for you. If you've shared my life with me, then my life is shared with you. This is the story of Abraham. In Genesis 18, if you want to look this one up, Abraham's sitting under the big camera, you know. Uh, he's, it's the heat of the day, you know, you, you're seeing movement in the sands of the difference, distance, if you've ever seen that, you know, the, just waves of heat coming off the, the hot sand. And all of a sudden, he notices three strangers near him. And these are angels sent from God. And they, uh, and he rushes out, he he offers them a, a little water, so let me wash you, get your feet washed, you know, sit down a while, rushes in, tell Sarah, we have, a, we have guests, okay? Fix a meal. So he he's orders her to make, to use three seas of grain to make, it says make cakes with. Three seas of grain is 20 pounds of flour. 20 pounds of flour. I make a loaf every week for the brothers. That's two and a half pounds, and that keeps, that, that's a loaf like this. And it lasts us about a week, all right? You know, 20 pounds of flour is a lot of flour. Go kill the calf, fatted calf, you know? Do you know how long it's going to take to kill the calf, skin it, chop it up, get it in a pot, simmer it? It's, it's going to be an hour and a half, because I've done this recipe before, right? To get the meat tender. And then serve it with, uh, with the yogurt sauce and all the other things that are mentioned in that scripture, you know? They're going to be there for the afternoon. Meanwhile, what's Abraham doing? You know, I'm sure he was doing what my father did when guests came and my mother was in the kitchen making food. He would be entertaining the guests, right? So you're already sharing. The, this is what hospitality is about. It's about feasting together with the strangers, asking people who are not your kin to share your life and to find them in some ways Behold them to you as well. This is how in the ancient world and in many times the modern world, uh, the sitting down to eat means the sharing of life, a putting off of hostility, a beginning uh, or attempt to renew friendships. It's why we have, even in our country, state dinners. Do we not? This is all the meaning of it. So what is the meaning of this for you? Whose house are you in? 
God's house? Has he invited you to sit down with him today to eat and drink? What does that mean, therefore? Under your, are you under his protection? You know, salt is often described in terms of holy wisdom and so forth. Uh, the Old Testament says there is a covenant of salt between God's people and God. You know, strong, strong uh, it's like a marriage bond. You know, can't turn away from you, you can't turn away from him, like it or not. You can run from him, but you can never break this bond. You know, you'll always have this to answer for, that you have accepted, like our friend Jacob, you know, you have accepted the food of God as your own. What does that mean? What does that mean? You know, this is a holy meal in which Christ, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, Christ becomes our food. The memory of his passion is uh, recalled. The soul is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us, the endless feasting of heaven, that joy, that intimacy, that union, that unbreakable bond, which is being forged now as God gives you life. If you remember, the end of that story of Abraham is that the angels predict, the angel that represents God himself, predicts that this time next year, you will have a son. Yeah, Sarah will have a son. She's like 100 years old. You know? And Sarah hears this in the kitchen back you know, through the tent wall. And says, she, she laughs. I'm going to have pleasure, she says, at my age. You know? and, uh, and the angel says, you laughed. Oh, I did not laugh. Oh, but you did. You did. And of course, what's the child's name? Yitzhak, Isaac, which means in Hebrew, laughter. So God is coming to bring joy to us as well. We are given a son to be ours, you know, our brother, our Lord, our companion, uh, just as a mother. I mean, this is the meaning of food, is it not the sharing of life? From the milk we take from our mother's side to the blood and water that flow from the side of Christ. Uh, the, all of this means that we are the friends of God. We are the beloved of God. We are called to act as the beloved of God, and having received the hospitality of God, to act as guests and more than guests, as members of his household, for that is how we are being treated. And so this means to go and show forth the goodness of God. It means to, uh, to treat others as we have been treated. If you have been received the hospitality of God Most High, should you not make of your own homes and your own lives a place of hospitality for others? Especially for those who may be a little, who may be strange you know, those who may be difficult, those who the world may not have a place for because you don't fit in, you're not my group. Especially nowadays, everybody's polarized. We're all in knots of screaming voices at each other. You know? We're called to be something different, you and I, as Christians, as as members of the household of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that is to bring the peace, the order, the hospitality that we have received to others. Now, there's many ways to show that. I had, uh, I remember having a conversation once with a brother of mine who was uh, English. It was, uh, it was a, co a convert to the faith, but it came from Yankee origins. And I was complaining about, you know, with my Irish household, when we have a party, you know, it starts at night and you walk and you drive home in daylight, right? You know, and you know you try to keep food and drink in the house all night, you know, so that as the old poems used to say about guests in an Irish hole, so they that their knives do not go on grease nor their uh, their mouths not smelling of ale. Um, whereas he said, you know, well in my house growing up, what they we put the food out and when the guests finished it, they left. Very different thing. When I was a pastor in Kentucky, you know, I couldn't get my English parishioners, English Catholics, uh, you know, originally East, East Coast Marylanders, couldn't get them to party for more than two hours. You know, it's like you had to go home and do chores or something, or the day just, just not worth it. And I'm, no, I'm sure some of you guys know what that's like. But my point is, in the many ways that you can show hospitality, you need a heart that's open and like Abraham at the door of his dent willing to get up and take responsibility for the people God puts in your path. Because that's how we 
we, we communicate the faith of Christ. I mean, everybody I've ever heard who has entered the church enters not so much through intellectual argument, but they, they've met somebody who is really on fire. And that's what we need to be. That's, need how we need, need, that's how we need to live if we are truly be, you know, the, the companions of Jesus Christ, if we are truly be the family of God, if we are truly be children of Abraham, children of the Father Most High.